Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Perspective Philosophy where we try to better our perceptions of the world through philosophical discussion. Sorry it is a bit late today. Well, I think it's a bit, it's not actually late for you guys. It was late for stands to it stands to reason. Uh, and I apologize. It stands to reason. I did actually expect myself to be here sooner, but better late than never I suppose and we're going to be discussing antinatalism. Um obviously those of you who follow the channel will see that I've talked about this topic numerous times and I've had some pretty interesting discussions with antinatalists. Um, my positions have, I think, remained the same. I'm not convinced by the antinatalist position, although I am sympathetic to it in many ways. I think that it's a genuine ethical issue that needs to be investigated, whether we should or should not have children, but that it does not create a let's say a universal principle there is no judge universal principle of whether we should or should not have children and i think that that would uh, deny both the anti-natalist and the natalist position so um i'm gonna call it stands to reason now we're gonna have this discussion and then afterwards we're also gonna get into demon mama's gender takes which i saw yesterday um like it, it just i saw yesterday on destiny stream and it just Honestly, it was something, something wild. And I just, I can't wait to get into it. Um, if breeding animals isn't vegan, how is breeding humans? Because I don't lock animals or humans in a cage. It's like, if there's no, nothing wrong necessarily with like, if, if they, if you had two dogs and they bred, like, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Like, I don't, I don't, I'm not like, oh no, <laughs> puppies. <laughs> Um, like you know, it's it's more like don't birth them for the consumption and exploitation of uh, that humans want to you know, kind of do with them. It's more of like what we're doing to animals, not necessarily the existence of animals. I'm not a vegan because I'm an antinatalist. So anyway, uh, anyway, so uh, antinatalists aren't cringe. I think antinatalists have some pretty interesting points. I think that you're genuinely worth listening to them. Anyway, so we're gonna get into it, and um, it's answer reason uh, might stand with reason on this topic but not you pp well I'd, I'd, I'd well we'll see won't we um anyway let's get into this hello hello um how you doing mate good how are you i'm pretty good so you want to discuss antinatalism with us uh, sure. Right. So, uh, do you want to low down of where I'm at with antinatalism and then we can take it from there? Because I've had a few discussions with antinatalists. Um, uh, mostly good, one bad, I'd say. Um, or like, mostly good and then like a few bad with the same guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, All right. Yeah, sure. That sounds good. Um, can I call you Lewis? Oh, absolutely. Uh, is, should I? Okay. What should I call you? Is, is You can call me Dave. Dave, great. Yep. Right, Dave. What should I do? What do you want? To, do you want to start? Do you want us to start? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and tell me. You know, get, kind of give an idea where you're at, uh, and then we can get into my thoughts on it. Okay. So my understanding of antinatalism is a philosophy which seeks to prevent the birth of any sentient being, usually not just uh, humans, um, for the act of prevent prevention of suffering. Um, the philosophy seeks to argue that any birth that is, um, that any birth that is, um, that, that we do, you know, perform like as in like we partake and actively birth someone, we are culpable for the suffering that is brought into the world. Um, some argue for an asymmetry. Benatar's asymmetry on that, where we are culpable for the suffering, but not for the well-being. Um, some argue that even if we were culpable for the well-being, there is no such thing as well-being, and there is only really suffering um, in general. So even if we are culpable for the well-being, then all we are doing is all saying that we are culpable for the diminishment of suffering anyway, which could have been prevented. And um, then there's more complex forms, I think it's like Cabrera's position um which is whether there is a positive um evaluation of existence or a negative evaluation of existence itself um i can't remember caprera's position too well off the top of my head i had a very long discussion with it with seven of swords 
Um, and I found that a very interesting position, but I think that it had to make claims about existence being good or bad in and of itself before we could get into that when it was it, when it was trying to evaluate uh, negative ethics before positive ethics. So that's what I know about antinatalism so far. Um, as of yet, I'm not convinced that there is any universal principle of whether um, it is right or wrong to have children. I think that it's contextual. I think that it depends upon the circumstances that you are going to birth those children into, whether their subjectivity will be respected, whether you're doing it for the right reasons, and whether the environment and the context of society will allow for their flourishing. So, um, yeah, that's where I stand. Okay. Cool. Um, you mentioned if it's done for the right reasons, what, what kind of reasons would be right ones? Um, okay. So I would say like the first thing is to do is to show like the wrong reasons. So I would say the, um, anything which is, um, the inconsideration of the being being born. So, you know, breeding them to be eaten, for example, um, um, not treating them, treating them as a means to an end and not ending themselves. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, pause there for a second. So what justifications or what reasons are given that fit that criteria? Um, that aren't using them as a uh, uh, means to an end. Right. So you say lot, like a lot of reasons are because um, I want to, you know, carry on my lineage, you know, uh, lineage or to uh, help the economy, to help my nation, to further the species. A lot of these are, are common responses, but I guess my question is which one of these in your head, in your mind are for the benefit of the child themselves? Well, I think that you could have, um, like, so for example, when you talk about, let's say, the well-being of humanity, if it was for the well-being of humanity, the child would be considered human and be considered within that. But that would mean that they would have to be treated, uh, I think, as um, an end in that endeavor as well. Like, you couldn't make them a slave class. They would have to be of the same um, of the same um, category as everyone else. So if you're considering the universal category of humanity from which they are then considered, I don't think that's necessarily an exploitative relationship, so long as they aren't actually being exploited. Like, you're not birthing them as slaves or something like that. Okay. I, I understand that idea. I don't... Um, so... I diverge from a lot of anatalists in, in some areas, um, but one thing I, I would say is I don't consider humanity uh, the label um, to be really meaningful as far as ontology. I I, I consider sorry. individuals important, not uh, uh, humanity you a as, as, a, as a whole. You're like a nominalist um, or something. Yeah. Ah, uh, you see, you see, so, I'm 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 a I'm a realist, so I'm an indifferentist. Okay. So I don't think uh, that when we talk about humanity, that humanity would, I think humanity precisely is uh, one and the same as the lived experiences of all humans. It is the actual subjectivity of hum humans, like uh, anthropocentric subjectivity. I don't think that it's morally that important. Like, I think that when it comes down to ethics and the consideration of what is ethically important, that actually is grounded in sentience um, and the subject object relationship. Um, um, and as right, that, so, uh, so like, if you wanted to say like, it's bad for everything, but humans. And so you're doing it for humans. I'm like, well, you shouldn't do, you shouldn't just consider us. Yeah. So like this idea that, you know, if, if humans stopped reproducing, humanity would die out to me is not a justification because there's nothing in, uh, innately valuable about hu the label of humanity or our particular species in, the, in the objective universe. Right. But it doesn't it's have to be. The, I mean, I mean, yeah. I would say that there was something innately valuable about subjectivity itself. I would 100% say that. And I'm a moral realist. I'm like a moral objectivist in that respect. And I would say that subjectivity is inherently valuable. Um, and as such, humans as being subjects are inherently valuable. But I would okay. also respond as well, saying that just because it's not inherently valuable doesn't mean that it can't um, be... Um, just because it's not the, the, let's say, like intrinsically morally valuable doesn't mean that it can't be extrinsically morally valuable for example more humans may produce a better overall experience of subjectivity in the world like i'm not a, one I'm, I'm gonna posit this and i'm saying i'm not a utilitarian when i give this example but a utilitarian might for example say well if humans are living better lives then having a lot of humans would necessarily create a better outcome right now 
I don't actually agree with that. I think I don't actually think more is better, right? And I think that's a, a mistake on their part. But you could say that the expression of subjectivity for humans requires maybe it's like a certain balance of how it like birth to death ratio, right? Um, right, but that, that kind of begs a question. In when you say that um, humanity, I'm sorry, subjectivity is valuable to humans, that assumes there's humans to value it. Oh, no, but no, if you're no, comparing no, two that. situations where you have no one, no one exists, and you have some humans, right? The, the experience, the subjectivity of those humans is valuable uh, in relationships uh, within them. So I'm, I'm not saying that subjectivity is valuable to humans. I'm saying subjectivity is valuable in and of itself. So like if there was no humans and there was only pigs, they, they're valuable. They might know it, like they don't do ethics. They might understand, like, oh, that they are like valuable in themselves, but they are valuable in themselves. Okay, um, just so we're on the same page here. I, I can, when I say people or humans, um, I, I know that's a common vernacular, and I don't mean to, to be exclusive. I do mean sentient beings. I'm mm. a vegan, and so I, I value all sentient. Good lad, what uh, a good lad. Okay, so we're on the same page there. Um, so it's more of shorthand, or, or maybe a, a habit of speech. Right. So yeah. So well, yeah, I, yeah. So like yeah. I, I mean, would consider. Go ahead. Yeah. Like so, if there was no subject-object relationship in the world, there'd be no such thing as like good, bad, right, and wrong. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. So, okay, that's fine. I, 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 I guess I can um, kind of give you my perspective and and see what you think of it. I mean, I will say this: that if you uh, you if you do hold to that, that really. I mean, people that are like, do you agree with Julio Cabrera? Because I think he would really push back on that. Because like, he seems to, I think from what I understand, he seems to think that ethics can be negative. Like, so that you can, you can have an ethical consideration without subjective. I mean, I don't agree with his position necessarily. I don't know if he's a non-naturalist. So I'm I, like, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure what like metaphysical ground he's taken. But I know that he wants to say that there is a a negative ethic so that like you don't actually have to have existence for ethics to exist. Um, but would you agree that? Yeah, ethics I, are... No, I don't agree with that. I'm so my ethical perspective is probably unique amongst the people you've uh, talked with. Um, well, we'll and get, we'll get into it, yeah. it, it, it springs from the, it, I don't even want to call it like a moral realist position because that uh, that kind of implies some kind of um, non-subjective reality, um, but so the idea is that uh, morality is grounded in the reasons that sentient beings have to promote or inhibit desires. Oh, okay. um, and so I, I, I don't just, think I'm uh, that far off. To be honest, so you would say that okay. if you say that again, so like, uh, was it like, uh, like, uh, was it like the uh, reasons? Yeah, the reasons that sentient beings have to promote or inhibit desires. So you say that ethics. So is it ethics or morality? What, what are you saying? Like morality or like? Do you do you care about the distinction? Or are you just using it synonymously? So um, so I I usually consider ethics as applied morality. Okay. So they're they're, they're, they're okay. very related but distinct. Okay, so you're saying applied, you take that as applied morals. Okay, so, um, and then the reasons, um, and, and morality is the reasons that, uh, the reasons, sorry, could you say that again? The reasons? Sure. The, the reasons that beings have to promote or inhibit, uh, desires. And those reasons themselves are based on their own desires. Okay. Um, so it's Lupin. Okay, right. The thing, so yeah, so ultimately, so to have or promote, to have or uh, the reasons that beings have to promote or inhibit desires. Okay. And so, and those reasons themselves are founded upon desires. Right. Yeah. So this would be considered a coherentist okay. view, not yeah. foundational. All right. Are you going like, I feel like, the ghost of like maybe it's like Heidegger or Kierkegaard like le like looming over us or something. And like you know, <laughs> I don't know. To be honest, I don't. Uh, I know you you were, you talk about those guys a lot. I don't know a lot about um, really either one of them. So well, it's, it's, it I apologize. Like, I'm not that no. as, as well versed as you are. Certainly. No, no, no. It's not that. It's that it, I can. It, it seems continental, 
Um, it's just not that. It's just like, obviously, you're saying that you don't want to call it realist because you want to make it subjective. And that implies to me that you don't think that there is like an objective subject, like in a Hegelian sense. So you kind of want to limit it to the individual themselves. And like, maybe it's like kind of like, um, I don't know, like, I I'm not too well versed on Schopenhauer and stuff, but on like, or, or like uh, Kierkegaard even, I'm, I'm somewhat well versed on them, but not amazing with Kierkegaard. Um, but it seems like a subjective will and that everything kind of the like, truth is subjectivity and it boils down to like, you know, your own subjectivity and your own sort of actions in the world. And so, so is that where we're at? I, is it, so is it like that or is it? So it's, it, it's, it depends on how, uh, the way you're using the word, word subjective because there's two, um, common usages, right? There's, uh, subjective versus objective meaning uh independent of one's attitudes towards the truth of a proposition mm -hmm. um you know ice cream is good is subjective right mm -hmm. um and then the other the other clear um uh, distinction is mind dependent yeah right so uh, i this view is objective in the first sense in that the conclusions or the 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 truth aptness does not depend on the attitudes of the one making the evaluation, uh, but it is subjective in that it is mind dependent and requires subjects to have desires and to have reasons to promote. Okay, so it's going to be epist epistemological objectivity. You're going to say that there is actually nominally only particulars, but there can be truth or, uh, but there is like a truth about those particulars. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah, that, okay. and we can yeah we can say there's like um, generally uh, broadly true uh, state prop, um, propositions like uh, murder is wrong. Um, that's not a like a Kantian imperative or anything, but it is generally true of the uh, population. So if I was to say murder is wrong, you would say that that would be let's say the that would reflect the reasons. It would be true. What would you would say is it would be. It would be true that every agent, or that most agents, um, uh, desire right. so way, to promote, would phrase it, desire to you, inhibit I mean, the motives for murder or something. Right. So, um, so murder is wrong because uh, beings generally have re many and strong reasons to inhibit desires that cause people to murder. Beings have strong reasons to inhibit yeah. the desire. Yeah, and, and I would say, um, so I don't take a bipolar uh, view of any statement. It's to the degree that that uh, beings generally have reasons to promote or inhibit those desires. Um, okay. So you could have a um, some statement like abortion is wrong, right? Abortion is a very controversial topic because there are reasons to promote or inhibit on both sides of the matter. And so... The objective uh, standing of that statement is that it's good to a degree, uh, and that depends on the reasons that people generally have, and it's uh, wrong to a degree. And, you know, that may be like, if you think of it like as a uh, positive or a negative, it, it'll have some valence, a positive, um, and then be pulled in the other direction, and where that actual balance is, it would be the actual... Uh, final evaluation okay so it seems to me that you want to say that like everyone kind of has their own reasons for for action right and that comes down to their own yeah. desires and that those desires and where would you say that those desires come from are they being like caused by something else or are they choosing them? they're no they're caused by genetics and their environment okay so materialist okay caused by uh material we'll just put right okay so right so what you want to say like i, I think in some respects, I kind of push back in talking about. It. So it seems like you're kind of a compatibilist in this respect, yeah. Um, uh, so compatibilist as far as free will, you mean? Yeah, yeah. So this um, kind of relies on determinism being true, mm -hmm. because okay. uh, the reasons have to be motivated by desires, right? And you can't act in a way that uh, goes against your own desires. So why should I endorse a universal principle if I can't act against my own desires, If especially if I say that the material process which led me to be has a, includes a sex drive and a desire to reproduce and, you know, pass on my genes? Sure. 
Um, so to say something should be the case means that there are reasons for it to be the case, not necessarily reasons you have, but reasons that exist. And those are the same reasons I'm talking about when I say, when I say that people generally have reason for you to X, um, it means that okay. there are, I'm sorry. I said, okay. I just said, okay, I'm just listening. I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm okay. just, I'm just, oh, okay. <laughs> right. So, um, so I, I agree that maybe you, uh, when you, when you're thinking like personally, you, maybe sh you shouldn't, um, abstain from procreation. Right. But generally speaking, people and um, the reasons I'm an analyst are not specifically due to the desires to procreate. They're, they are due to the consequences of those actions. Yeah, but I mean, why, why do they matter? Like look, like, like, look at it from my perspective. So I'm looking at, at it from, like, if all of this is hard determined, then the ability to um, modify the, let's say, the actions of the population based upon... Uh, universal ethical principles implies that there is like some sort of agency that an individual could like had the option to act otherwise and that, or that that in fact this discourse isn't just you know another you know um performative action which is controlled by you know let's say our own base drives and so on so what kind of so the the, the, the this is the issue like well, there's a few issues right that that are that kind of I, i've got a problem with uh so far okay um one, the universality of this seems to really, I mean, like, obviously, it seems like you want to say that everything is almost particularized to the desires of the individual agent, um, which, like, I have issues with that even working, but we'll not get onto the metaphysical issues just yet. I think we can just work on the sort of epistemological ones. Um, so it seems to me that we need to look at it like, right, so... All of this is founded upon, let's say, the, the, the causal nat uh, nature of material. Um, my, de my desires to reproduce have come from a long series of evolution, uh, my engagement in society, it's the sublimation of my drives. All of that has been produced by a causal relationship that pre-existed my birth, and I'll be influenced um, in and out of um, you know, various desires and expressions um, uh, you know, until I, I die. And that's that's it, right? That's that's kind of all I am. And then, yep. and then in that, you also want to say that well, there is when we talk about you know morality, we're saying that these desires that we have, and I think that kind of almost need to talk about a soft like like a, like a soft determinist sense for this to to make much sense. Where you say like, well, look, yeah, we are all determined, but we've all been determined with these desires, and so we're all actually trying to express these desires. Um, and that's what we're talking about in terms of morality. Um, and in which case, I don't think that's, I mean, that's compatibilism, I would say, basically. Um, and I think that, I think I've kind of got to imply that. Like, I don't think that necessarily, I don't think it's free will, like in the grand scheme of things. Okay. Um, okay. But like, that's, I think that's what you're kind of arguing for, at least in some respects. Um, and well, then, and I then, would, sorry. Let me just interject one thing. So, uh, the the reason this works is because uh, humans are are the kind of beings whose many of our desires are malleable, and they can be influenced by our environment, uh, which includes other people, mm -hmm. and the speech acts of praise and condemnation uh, can deterministically have effect on our our own desires. Yeah, and you well, this right. is the thing. So, like, what you're actually doing is like you're saying, like, I'm determined to try and influence your drives and you're determined to try and influence my drives. It's not right or wrong. It's just matter in motion. Right. Right. So the, the, the terms right and wrong, um, are statements of, are attempts at a statement of truth, right? They're, they're attempts to say what wrong means is that there's many people that exist or many beings that exist that have reasons to cause you to have different desires. Well, I, I mean, one, I would right. say that when That's, we talk about right or wrong, I think we're actually saying that there isn't, you are incorrect um, about that behavior being justifiable or not. And I would say that's what, but like what you're doing here is you kind of, you, you're having to define ethics as a subsect of physical, um, of, of physics, 
because of you're you're taking a physical stance, right? Like ethics is like a subsect of like epistemolog or at least epistemologically, um, uh, uh, like um, posterior to let's say like um, like you know material consequences. So you're like, well, ethics has arisen from a biological process which is let's say promoted pro-social behaviors which have allowed us to express our drives. Yeah, I would say that's probably pretty close to accurate. Right. Okay. Um, so the re the I guess the if there's a goal of this version would be uh, what's uh, referred to as a harmony of desires, where it doesn't mean everyone has the same desires, but it means that all desires are mutually uh, beneficial. But I wouldn't even say harmony. I think that looking at it like harmony is is probably the wrong way because, like, you could have a desire to conquer everyone and there's nothing wrong with that desire um so long as you can convince other people through speech acts that to acclimate that desire there's you know that's fine or might makes right even it like there is no actual like in terms of um like because there's no actual standard to judge these reasons this is what i was getting onto really so there's no standard epistemologically to judge these reasons as right or wrong as in good or bad in themselves since it's all particularized and you wanted to particularize it the universal principles that you wanted to make in terms of uh you know allowing for this harmony being good or or you know um or anti-natalism or anything that it may be whether it's murder is wrong um don't actually obtain uh, this is why I would say that this leads to what would be more akin to a Nietzschean position, right? So Nietzsche would just turn around and say, like, yeah, truth actually is actually uh, is only a representation of will. Um, the only things that we're actually trying to do is um, essentially express our desires. Um, in the expression of our desires, we come into conflict with one another, and truth now becomes a currency, and so and moral truth, especially in this, as a way to um, essentially forward our own drives. And then the more people who acclimate the truth that we, you know, profess, the more likely we are to obtain and express our subjectivity. So truth is a currency. All right. Well, I, I don't necessarily agree with um, that as far as truth. I would say that we have um, praise and condemnation acts that uh, we use to get others to have different motivations um, to act. So, uh, you know, it's... If I don't want to be harmed, um, I have reason to cause others to not have desires that uh, cause them to harm others, right? So that my my chances of being harmed are, are lowered. Only if you re only if you accept that risk reward ratio, right? Because you could just approach morality from a totally different perspective. Like rather than looking at like morality, like so, let's say you are like Calisys in Gorg in Gorgias, right? Where he's like, let your desires wax and wane at the highest and utmost degree. The only reason that we are engaging morality is to you know depower the stronger, uh, to prevent ourselves from being hurt. But th this is the thing. So if we accept that all it is is desires, there are no actual um positive or negative desires in themselves people are just doing what they want and they're doing it because they have been you know maybe it's the way that they've been raised you know the, the biology whatever it is um that like source you like that that's the that psyche you know that uh, pathology um and so there, let's say you get like this really strong charismatic um a super intelligent um you know just absolutely godlike me like murderer right who everyone thinks is a stand-up person because they're incredibly charismatic. Let's say they've managed to get themselves into politics, like a good psycho, and um, or like econ like you know, into some like Wall Street or something. They gain an incredible amount of power. Um, you know, they sacrifice children on the weekend, and no one bats an eyelid because they don't even think about them. Right? Why should that person engage in a universal principle which is going to delimit their power and not allow for the greater expression of their desires? Um, well, what do you mean by should? Do you mean personally or moral morally? Well, is moral because not personal for you? Because it seems like it no. is. So, oh, no, okay, no. then I've totally misunderstood. How is moral okay. universal? Uh, morality is the aggregate of all the reasons. All right, so it's the right. aggregate of all the reasons, right? So, right. but wait a minute. So, what I don't understand is, let's say I have a reason that totally contradicts your reason, like I'm pro killing you and you're against killing me. I mean, like, you're against me killing you, right? Like, let's say like that. Like, so, like, serial killer, that guy, wants to kill the kids on the weekend. They don't, they have reasons to live. He has reasons to kill them. Why should he accept their reasons to live over his reasons to kill them? Okay, so, 
First of all, the, the truth of um, what I'm talking about is not dependent on if someone believes they have a reason to or if they should. It's, it's an objective uh, statement of the way the world is. And in the world, I mean uh, the brain states of the beings that live in it. So yeah. Okay, but that, that's, uh, that's fair enough. But then it's got to be action, urge, right? So because it's morality and we're talking about something which is regulating and drives, like why right. they should, it has to be action urging. So it has to somehow relate to why, like they have to have some sort of motivating force, which will make, let's say, you could, like, let's say you were to describe the, to them, yeah, like, look, everyone thinks you're an asshole, objectively. Like, this is wrong. And he's like, I don't care. <laughs> okay. So, well, <laughs> well, Lewis, I, I, I think if you're if you're asking me to come up with a a, a motivating force that isn't based on someone's desires, then you're you're asking for me to to do magic because that doesn't exist. Well, I I, I, right? I, 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 well, I don't know, like. The Kantians, like, if there's any Kantians in chat, they're probably losing their shit here in that. Like, I know that. I know Marty. I know Marty would be like, "What do you mean? You're motivated by reason alone?" Like, anyway, they, they you know, they, um, uh, but like, yeah, well, I, I think, I think, uh, I think you're right. I would actually endorse that. Um, it is drive that moves us. Um, I think. So what I can but say I, is, I, I, what I, can I, say I wouldn't is... particularize what drives, and I think that's yeah. the difference. I think you've. Like the way that you you're looking at ethics is because you're looking at it in a physicalist, um, kind of subjective, on on ontologically subjective, uh, sorry, um, yeah, ontologically subjective, but epistemologically objective. Like there is a truth about you, but it's the moral truth is only about you, right? Do you know what I mean? Um, or if well, we aggregate them, would... then it's then it's nominally true. So like, it's like there are twelve chairs, but like that the existence of those 12 chairs is only a description of 12 individualized particularized chairs the truth of those chairs is actually that there are one 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 and 12 until you get to 12 yeah. you know like the actual right. the, or the concept of chair the universal concept that is shared by them in this sense is actually just a um stand in it doesn't actually have any meaning uh beyond the uh pointing towards ostensibly pointing towards uh, you know, some sort of particularized uh, subject, but this right. is well ontologically. Yeah, I agree. They don't. It doesn't have meaning. But if, if we're talking, um, you know, about labels and how we're going to uh, talk about things, you can say there's, you know, twelve chairs because we want we have twelve people we need to to each have a seat for. I I, I don't want to get. Um, yeah, yeah no, 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 that's example, fine. But... And I think that's exactly what a, like a nominalist would say. Like they were like, yeah, yeah, we have twelve chairs. Except when I talk about chair, I just mean a given chair. Um, it's like when I talk about. So if you go like, oh, when I'm talking about subjectivity and the aggregate reasons that those subjectivity have, you when you add them all up, you you like the like the nominalist would turn around and go, well, no nah, man, you can't really add like you, you like you can say like everyone has their reasons. That's true. But those reasons obtaining, like, there is no truth that is, you know, greater than those reasons. There's no reasons why those individuals should reason something else, you know? Like, you can't go, yeah. like, you, you should reason uh, that murder is wrong. You're just like, oh, you do reason that murder is wrong and somebody else reasons that murder is right. And, um, I mean, I deny all of this. I'm not going to lie to you, like, all of it. But um, I'm just going to point out the epistemological issues. Like, if we did go down this line of reasoning, then then the universal principle of antinatalism wouldn't obtain. Uh, it, it, that, that, that's, the, that's the issue with... This is the issue with particularizing subjects. If you're talking about the... the it, it becomes... Um, it, it becomes, in, I would say, uh, almost accidental or coincidental. I don't even think... I would argue we couldn't have knowledge over it and, and you know... I'll fight anyone who says otherwise, but the even if we could have knowledge over it, the, we couldn't have, uh, let's say, a universal guiding principle uh, motivating that individual to act that wasn't then also particularized to them. You'd have to go, okay. well, your desires, do, do you know what I mean? You'd have to be like your personal belief system and... And this is what people get into online. They're like, you know, for example, ask yourself or something. They'll be like, well, wait a minute. No, we're just talking about you right now. We're talking about why you want to kill animals. And then he puts them through, you know, the, um, what is it? Like name the trait. Yeah. And he's trying to show a contradiction in the way they're thinking to try and show that their personal individuated drives are in confliction 
right? Now you see, I, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't agree with necessarily how this works. I don't, I don't but, agree with his uh, methodology either, so yeah, uh, I think I we're think on the same page there. I think you um, have to do something I did want to. I did want to... I'm sorry, go ahead. So this is the thing. I think you'd have to do something like that, and it would primarily be for the act of trying to persuade them against it. And this is why I think you would ha kind of have to agree in some respects with Calices in Gorgias, right? When he's like, the weakest, uh, you know, uh, the morality is the expression of the weak trying to gain power over the stronger. If there was some, like, some super, like, powerful maniac who liked killing people, you'd be, like, trying to convince them not to kill people for well, your benefit and for the benefit of the of your desires, but that's as far as you'd get, you know? No, I don't, I don't have to convince them. I can just say that people generally have many and strong reasons to convince him, but it doesn't make it moral for him to want to do that. It just means that he has a desire he shouldn't have. But it would be. It, well, that's the thing. You shouldn't have. This is the thing. Like, right. What do you mean by moral? Like, What you're, you're, you're describing in morality is the aggregation of mor morals, right? It would be when you say moral, if you are relating it to a particular individual's reasoning, and that reasoning is always uh, um, individuated... Oh, oh, oh. I, okay, there's would... confusion here. All right. Okay. I don't mean reasoning. I don't mean like someone's reasoned into this belief or uh, this... Because, right, you, you have uh, the ability to reason and form beliefs. But when I say uh, a reason to do something, I mean that they have a motivation to do it or a desire, right? Uh, it, desires are not reasoned into. They precede reason. Yeah, so like, and then the, then the morality is based off those desires, right? The desires, but not the reasoning itself. Like, yeah, uh, so you can have a the, false belief. Exactly, but th that means the, the reasoning. So, so you're saying that, so like the reasoning, so let's say someone comes to a correct belief about themselves. They actually do have the desires to... Mm -hmm. um, kill children right sure which is i think we would agree that's that makes them an absolute maniac and they should definitely be stopped so but we'll get on to that later, in a minute right. um and let's say they've reasoned themselves into some sort of like position that they you know because they actually like they know that if they kill children they feel happy um or at least they, okay uh, they, so just stop there for a second okay let me ask you that based right. on uh, based on that situation does their attitude toward, towards killing children mm -hmm. change anything about the rest of the population's attitude towards their own children being killed? No. No. So the, the fact that they want to do that has, is n has no bearing on whether, under my system that I'm referring to, whether it's morally okay or not. But this is the thing. Like, what you're describing as morally okay is just, let's say, collectivized judgment. And it just seems like the collectivized judgment isn't necessarily well, that, have any more rational force. Not, not like, judgment. Uh, the collective reasons, right, which are desires based, not judgment based. Like oh, yeah, okay. I just wanted to be this clear is, that this is this is what I'm kind of confused at, right? So let's right. say like let's say he's let's say that they're in this case, like let's say the popular if the population that's if and we'll just assume that like this is the case. And if this is the case, it'll maybe help us understand your system a bit more. Do, if, does the population agree he wants to kill children? Like, if he's like, I want to kill children, I will kill a child right now. Would the population agree that he wants to kill children? Um, sure, I don't see why it's relevant, okay. but go ahead. Okay, right, because if they were saying that he was epistemologically incorrect, and that he's wrong that he wants to kill children... Uh, that's probably closer to my position. I'd be like, you are actually wrong. <laughs> you know, um, you, you're incorrect well, about your own, I, your own judgment. Grant, yeah, I grant so, that some people do want to do, they really do want to do some very antisocial things. I I would allow them the Yeah, the I mean, I would, I would agree as well. I, I think that they do want to do some antisocial things, but I'd say that they were, one, wrong for endorsing that as the content of their desires, and two, they were wrong that they thought that it was going to make them happy. They were wrong about the conclusions in their relationship to themselves. They were wrong about their well, self-knowledge. Yeah, um, I would go even further and say, yeah, maybe it'll make them really happy. But that doesn't change the rest of the population's attitude uh, towards that act. See, this right? is the they thing. They still have I'll, reasons 
to inhibit it. You see, this is the thing because I'm I'm an indifferentist. I would say your happiness and my happiness are actually one and the same thing. So when I, when, so when, we're, when we're doing ethics, we're considering the same concept. So if I'm trying to find some sort of end, means ends relationship and balance my life that doesn't consider your means ends relationship, then I'm actually not performing uh, rationally. I'm not considering the universality of the concepts that I'm actually using to deduce what is good and bad, right and wrong, which is why like, I'm an objective, like sort of uh, an objective realist, like in this respect, I'm like, well, there is actually a right and a wrong ontologically and epistemologically, and we can find the truth of that matter, you know? Like, so like murder is wrong relates to these desire states and these experiences by individuals. You see, with you, in this case, morality is totally particularized. And this is the way I'm understanding. You co correct me if I'm wrong, because if I do not want to straw man you at all, it seems to me that desire is completely particularized from our socio-political environments and our material, which has led us to construct certain you know, dispositions towards attitudes. And these are just causal, right? We're not actually able to modify them beyond, you know, just the way that we are modified by, you know, matter in motion, right? Um, as we're going through life, the change, the sometimes change, the sometimes like got modified by actions, interactions through other people. But that's just what happens. It's just a description. It's not necessarily a prescription. There's no like sort of prescriptive attitude which tells me that you should uh, be a murderer or you should not be a murderer, that kind of thing, right? Now, right. in that, I have, when I'm trying to express my drives, that's just my biological organism trying to express my desires in the world that I'm sub that have been sublimated, my drives that have been sublimated into my culture. Um, and if they've not been sublimated properly, then screw it. It doesn't matter. Like I'm, I'm an absolute beast in reality, right? You know, like I'm just like a complete, like utter, uh, trash, right? I just want to murder and loot and pillage. I'm, I'm just a modern day Viking, right? Let's just say that you just, okay. this person is a modern day Viking and they're just horrible, right? Like now, the only reason that we would give for that person to um there's only two answers that we could say that this person was wrong that they were one wrong that they actually thought that's what they were it's like mate you're not a modern day viking you're actually you'd be better suited to being like a gamer or something and maybe just playing video games and this is actually going to make you really sad um or something like that you know you're actually you're not actually a sigma male this actually doesn't make you harder this is all just kind of cringe and maybe we need to kind of take a step back from this scenario right um now that's one position where you just go you are actually physically wrong about yourself right and that's like, like okay. um that would be like an ont you're ontologically incorrect about yourself um and then then there is the the next point which would be that where I think you want to kind of take it that the that the uh, when you start talking about like the aggregation of reasons, and this is what kind of confuses us, because all of this is particularized to this given individual, right? So this given individual is this. Let's just assume that they are this modern day Viking. And we actually agree. Like, oh, you're a fucking brute. What the hell's wrong with you? Uh, we we're gonna lock you up, right? And let's say we're intent to prison this person, imprison this person. We wouldn't be able to say they were a bad person or that their actions were actually wrong. That they just contradict our our desires in this in this framework. And this aggregation of desires is really just a an alliance between similar desires. It's not actually that there is any truth towards our position being morally superior or not. And what we're talking well, about in terms of morality in this case is really just a power structure that we use to prevent, let's say, um, harm to ourselves. But if I was strong right. enough that I could overpower that entire structure, like let's say I've got like, I don't know, access to like nuclear codes or something, and I'm some sort of evil mastermind, then I there's nothing obligating me to do it. Like there's nothing wrong with my position. Right. So, um, yeah, I think I, I, I think you understand that I would reject the first one, um, not necessarily out of hand, but because I don't necessarily agree that he could actually be wrong about um, that being true of himself. Like he may just really want to be a Viking. Um, in the second case, I would agree that uh, in this particular case, the, the, the person um, is see the thing is the way I frame morality uh, is is not going to be um, 
compatible with the, with kind of the, the, the sentence structure you're using. So right. um, what, I, what, what I mean is like, if it doesn't matter if like a hundred people in the population want him to act differently uh, ontologically, like objectively, yeah, there's no like uh, intrinsic value in that. Right. Okay. But it is a, whether or not it's intrinsically or, or, or uh, ontologically valuable, it is a, it is true about that group of people. Yeah. Right. Whether or not they have the power to change his mind, whether or not they, they force him to do something is kind of irrelevant to this conceptual, this conceptualization of morality. It's do they all have reasons? And, and if they do, uh, we would say that those are moral reasons for that person not to behave like that. And, and the, the only distinction between like a, a, a reason that someone has versus uh, all the reasons is the same distinction between the money I have in my pocket and all the money that exists, right? It's just a distinction in um, perspective, I guess is the way to say it. I, um, it it's just, we can make a, a, a claim about the truth of attitudes within a population. And that claim is what I'm calling a moral claim. So it, whether or not that person is right or wrong about his own personal attitudes is kind of irrelevant. Uh, it's, it's a matter of whether the population at large, you know, whether or not they have the power to change his mind or, or actually can, they have reasons to, uh, at least to try to change his attitudes. Right. Um, and those reasons, now, those reasons are particularized. Like, so for example, like, like if he, to if, each if individual, he was, yeah. 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 So if he was to convince the population through a propaganda campaign that, but, well, hold on. Do you mean convince or change their desires? Like change their desires. And let's say like he indoctrinates them. They're all fascists now. Like, let's say he's okay. like a really great at propaganda, like Joseph Goebbels, um, somehow turns the entire population into a bunch of uh, mindless murderers. I mean, I guess that's kind of beyond even uh, those most filthy propagandists. But whatever. Um, let's just assume that this man changes um, like the minds of fifty one percent of the population. He has the majority. Uh, they're okay. all like, yeah, like actually, yeah, we should. Um, like, have you seen the film Battle Royale? <laughs> Uh, no, but I, I'm I'm okay with the scenario. Keep going. Yeah. So Battle Royale is basically the Hunger Games where it come from, and um, it's it's really brutal, and uh, it's actually a brilliant film. It's like Japanese, um, it's Japanese or Korean, I don't know. Anyway, anyway it's a brilliant film um, about basically how humans engage in, let's say, like survival like situations and stuff. Anyway, it's, it's got loads of ethical stuff in it, but it's um, you know basically you're thrown into a jungle, you're given weapons. And you're told only one person gets off alive or you're all going to get killed. That's how it's going down. Like everyone dies. You get basically, I think it's like a bomb around your neck or something. And you're basically told like, if you don't, you die. Um, it's something like that. Anyway, so it's it's a lovely film. <laughs> I see a heartwarming. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, like this is the thing. Let's say he was like, convinces the population that, that thank you for the follow, by the way. Uh, as he convinces the population that, you know, actually, we all want this brutal uh, entertainment. Like, yeah, gladiatorial combat, children murdering each other. It's going to be great. And everyone's like, 51% of people are like, yeah. <laughs> like, wow, <laughs> this is such a great idea. Um, that's moral now, yeah? Okay, so uh, my response to that would be, so let's say, let's consider this, this population that now want to kill each other, right? Um, oh, no, would no. you I agree mean, it's that organized mm -hmm. even like so? Like so, for example, um, it's it's only um, like the only people that we're gonna like you know gonna do it to are let's say I don't know have no loved ones who care about them individually or something like that. All orphans or something. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. But still, the oh, um, so the the act of killing someone that doesn't want to die. Uh, would you say that 
people generally have reasons to uh, condemn desires that cause others to want to kill? I mean, I, I mean, like, I would say that, like, overall, that there is a rationality behind ethics, which is objective. This is the thing. So I would make an argument that's metaphysically totally different to this. So I'm, like, in terms of, I'm trying to operate under what know, is your, your, your system I'm, I'm, right now. Okay, but if, but if, you, if you're just asking this colloquially, like, do I think that if, if, if we accept that humans act in the way that you're describing them to act, um, that they would have reasons, let's say, for self-protection to not allow this to exist? Yes, yeah, some, some may. But then that one you could say that he convinces them out of these reasons where they're like, actually, the the value of my protection uh, versus the entertainment value that I'll get is actually fair. Um, I'd rather live in Rome um, than live in, let's say, like modern day society. I'd rather have that kind of uh, relationship with uh, my peers where we all have a blast. Um, I'm probably safe oh. for the most part. And it's only those people who are undesirables who, or the min minorities who get punished. Well, I mean, those undesirables and minorities still exist, right? Mm -hmm. And they still have reasons to cause others to change their perspective. Yeah, but that, but minor also, but that minorities but in also, the moral system, that's yeah, what yeah. I'm kind of pointing out. Like, but, that, that's, they, they, yeah. It seems to me that the, the judgment, the aggregate of these reasons, if we even assume that they can be aggregated, which I kind of have a problem with as well, but then I think you're probably relating that to like maybe some sort of conceptualism, like the concept itself is real. Right, like, and that I think that's kind of what you're relating it to, like, kind of like Abelard or something. Mm -hmm. So it's like kind of like a form of know. conceptualism, right? And then, so what you're saying is that like there are these, there is this universal principle, which is actually just the aggregate of all of these other, um, like, particular principles, and that exists as what morality is. It represents the will of the people, right, in a kind of democratic um, aggregation, and that's that's all morality is. And then, so what I'm presenting is that we've got 51% of the population who are legit on board. Like, they think this is going to be great. I just want to know if, sure. they, if, if they think that, if that's now moral. Okay. Um, well, I, I guess I would ask... Well, I, I'm having a hard time with this hypothetical, but um, because I, I don't understand what you mean by they're on board with it. Do you mean they don't want to be killed themselves? Oh, that they're okay with the risk that, let's say, their children may be killed, or they and they don't want to be killed themselves. But none of these people are part of the group that is being selected. Um, the group that's being selected that can only be sampled for this battle royale is a minority group that represents ten yeah, percent okay. of the population. Um, okay, only that's, X number that's... of people. It they only kill so much as the breed, so that they'll always contain a sta uh, uh, um a standard population size that can be exploited indefinitely. Sure, but the, the general act type of uh, killing someone in this manner wouldn't just apply to the minority, right? Why, um, wait, wait, well, why not? So, like, we're talking about, like, a, a strict, like, for example, killing, like, outside of the Hunger Games, like, Battle Royale scenario. That's that's wrong. We're not going to let that happen. Uh, no, nobody wants that. We just want the Battle Royale uh, murdering these people for, for our entertainment. Right, but no one outside the game would, would want to be in it, right? Yeah, but none of it will be. Right. Only them 10%. Right, well, okay, so... Everyone has a reason uh, to not be part of that yeah, uh, situation. I agree. Correct. Well, okay. I have a reason not to be so, in the in the game. <laughs> right. So even if they want to have the games exist, they have reason to not want to be in the game. Yep. Uh, which means they really have reasons for the game not to exist because, in theory, uh, the act type, uh, not maybe not in the particular, like maybe they're not actually in danger of it happening. But um, the the distinction between them and somebody in the game is just arbitrary, which means, uh, in theory, the the power dynamic could change at some point. Uh, even even in just in theory, not necessarily in practice. But um, the fact is, they they wouldn't want to be part of that, right? They wouldn't want to be somebody in the game. I could and make, therefore, I, they I have make, reasons to make, cause others not to want to put them into the game. But I could make an absolute opposite argument. I could say that, like in trying to, in trying to, let's say, create this um, social alliance with this group, 
in order to so that this doesn't happen uh so that they're not they're removing the risk of this happening to them they could by and large be increasing the risk that this happens to them and they may fear that social alienation they might they might want to be considered even um as caring for this group no or, or they want to be considered like you know a spoil sport shit i mean people hate vegans right and like we're in a culture that's pretty reasonable um like i mean we're talking about a culture of people who are like <laughs> you know not the best people clearly <laughs> um, um yeah and uh they don't want to associate and alienate themselves in some sort of social hierarchy um like they're like okay well if i you know uh you know go with the group in this scenario uh, i'm safer than if i go against the group um yeah so the, there's that dynamic to consider. I mean, there's also the the the, the aspect of um, of the fact that well, actually they they actually want to watch the game too. Um, uh, so even if you were to say they have reasons for what not wanting the game to exist, those reasons have to supersede their reasons for wanting the game to exist in some sort of risk reward ratio that you would deem to be irrational, right? Um, so you'd have to go not like. Necessarily. Well, like they would have to go like for whatever reason that they desire, like because like, if we're saying that the desires are the action motivating process, which allows the individual to perform speech acts, and I'm assuming that you're coming from let's say a human point of motivation in which it's kind of passion orientated, that these reasons yep. would have to in be influenced, influence the passions so that the individual either feels more fear or compassion or whatever it is, which allows them to you know engage in a speech act to stand up to prevent this um, occurring. So entering the moral sphere uh, with their reasons to support the ab abolition of this game. Now, Right, that would, be, that would be the reason they do that, but that doesn't mean um, they, those are the only reasons that exist, right? So remember, this is uh, an objective basis of the aggregate of all individuals, right? right. So you could say, well, this group has power and they're going to, uh, they really want to see this these games happen and even they could even be caring for the the people who are being subjugated to it uh so you such so, that they're so you would say that like you could for example have something that's moral that could be impossible even so like you could have all you could have the aggregate of all of these reasons but then them not have the motivational force to actually change people's behavior yeah absolutely of course i mean what the fuck's the point <laughs> because yeah, because, uh, like, for instance, animals, um, they have reasons for us not to try to eat them, but they don't have the ability to convince us not to. I agree. No, I agree. And and, and I, I hope I'm not coming across as, like, um, I'm not laughing at your position because I think it's actually oh, no, quite, no. <laughs> I think it's quite interesting. Like, I actually really, like, uh, engaging. I just I just think that this, like, I love engaging in this um, sort of sort of thought experiment sort of thing. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I do disagree with your entire metaphysical position, but I disagree with everyone's entire metaphysical position. So this isn't, <laughs> this isn't something new to me. Okay. Uh, I think you actually uh, represent closer to the norm than I do uh, in terms of, like, even in philosophers. Uh, I'm an idealist, and the majority of philosophers, I'm pretty sure, are... Um, actually, I, I, I know that there's a lot of the science... Like, most are scientific realists, and I think in that, most are physicalists. But I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm an idealist. You're an idea. You're an idealist. Okay. Yeah, but probably not. I'm. I'm probably not the same kind of idealist as you are. Yeah, um, probably like a subjective well, idealist. That's why I thought like at the start, like, but it t then you started talking about like brain states causal, causally kind of producing. Behavior. Yeah, that, that's more like colloquial, like colloquially speaking. Um, yeah, I, I guess I could probably um, talk about this for hours, but uh, the actual topic of this conversation which we haven't really touched on oh yeah i, I um, guess I, the reason i'm asking is because it's like just to kind of bring it back is because we're talking yeah. about the application of these universal principles right like whether like there is a universal principle which if it existed in relation to the the um creation of you know a, a new generation of individuals like you know the creation of new humans being born um whether it would be right or wrong and whether an individual should look at it as right or wrong. Um, and alter their and I, would, I would assume that you're also talking about altering their behavior to reflect that right and wrong. Um, but what, yeah, kind of, sure. what kind of, I'm kind of getting mixed up here, is it seems that even if it was right and wrong, the, it's, the right and wrong of it is really just, it's, it's, 
it's kind of like a and like it doesn't actually have more truth in that it's actually better or worse like it's not actually a uh, like it doesn't necessarily express our desires and drive to a greater degree it's just a truth that there are reasons that exist um not not, not necessarily that those reasons uh, would allow for the you know the greater expression of subjectivity or some sort of better outcome it's just right. that the better outcome yeah. is the reasons you're saying that like we would all have a, a a kind of inclination that this is reasonable so let's let's put it in ways that i would describe my anti-natalist philosophy yes right? that's so, probably the best thing to do yeah for example um I think we would agree that uh, causing unnecessary and uh, let's leave it at that, causing unnecessary suffering is problematic at best and morally wrong uh, generally. Okay. So causing unnecessarily su unnecessary suffering is wrong. Okay. Okay. Do you agree with that? So the way I would say is we have a prohibition from causing unnecessary suffering. Um, so you think that's a, pro you think that's a prohibition? Um, um, or do you think that it's so like, okay, right. So wrong. You mean we have reasons to inhibit well, suffering to yeah, inhibit, let's to just, inhibit? Let's just, uh, um, call, uh, um, I know you're not going to agree with my, with my, the ontology of my morality. What I would like to uh, focus on is what we would agree with. Yeah. Yeah. And the conclusions oh, right. we would come okay, to just, based just, on our own. Sorry, moral, that, moral idea. So yeah, that's if, fine. If we can agree that um, causing unnecessary and um, un, well, I would say unjustified suffering, but I know a lot of people have question what does justified mean, right? I would, and, uh, yeah, and to what extent? But um, at the very least, we don't have to cause a new person to exist in order to solve some problem uh, with, you know, something. Uh, that they would be, they would benefit from. In other words, we're not uh, fixing a toothache that they have, right? We don't have to cause them to exist to fix a problem they have. In other words. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Right. Okay. Because uh, when we talk about justified, you know, uh, causing justified suffering, it might be something like you know taking someone to the dentist, and you know they're going to drill in their teeth, and it's really painful. Uh, but we know that there's a good reason to do that because they're going to have long-term dental health issues that they don't. Right. So that would be considered a justification. Right. Yeah. So like, cause you're, you believe in a coherence theory of truth. And from my, from what I remember the coherence theory of truth, it's sort of, um, you would say that there were, um, uh, related, essentially related belief states. Um, um, and that they are supporting belief states from what i'm from what i'm aware so it'd be like um if there was like a, a kind of like a normative hiccup that i had a belief that didn't um merge into the system or of um let's say like uh i believe that like i don't know i believe that unnecessary suffering is wrong i also believe that causing suffering is good and i also believe that uh you know that um like i, I don't know like uh Actually, it would be like because I think that'd be like a direct contradiction, which I think would be any system. Right, that would, like, but like, if, that, let's, that say that's, let's say like it's something a little bit more subtle. So, it would, I'd say I believe that um, that uh, unnecessary suffering is wrong. Uh, I believe that um, I don't know, uh, like stabbing people causes them to suffer. Um, and then I say I believe that stabbing people is not wrong. The argument would be, well, no, that doesn't cohere with the system of beliefs. You have two, you have two coherent beliefs, but you have one incoherency within that system, which you need to reevaluate. Right. Yeah. Yep. That, that's kind of where you're at with justification. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So just, just checking. Right, so, just, just checking. Sorry. Yeah. So that's, that's one ha part of it. Right. So we, ha then we have, um, so we, I think, uh, we're on the same page as far as, uh, prohibition from causing unnecessary and unjustified suffering. Uh, yeah, yeah I, just um, to... I mean, like, I would agree that we shouldn't cause unnecessary. I mean, if you're asking for my personal, like, positions here, then I'd say I'll, that we shouldn't cause unnecessary suffering, um, and that we should prohibit it. 
Um, okay. Yeah, so that's that's one step. Okay, so then, well, you could also uh, agree then that... Um, I would probably, if I may, I would probably say unjustifiable rather than unnecessary, because I think you can have uh, unnecessary okay. suffering, which is justifiable. Okay. Sure. Um, but what I mean, so what I mean necessary, I mean, there's nothing about the universe that requires that suffering. Yeah, right? I mean, there's nothing about, just, I mean, like, other than the fact that, like, you know, if mid causal materialism is true, then everything's necessarily, like, uh, determined. So, like, any suffering that happened was necessary in material terms. Uh, because you couldn't have acted otherwise. Well, it'll be contingent, right? But it, it, it would, it, I mean, yeah, it'd be contingent about things that you couldn't control. Right. Okay. Um, but with, with, as far as it's in your con control, you shouldn't do it, right? Yeah. So uh, the next part would be, well, we know that um, causing joy uh, or bliss or happiness is good, um, but it's not obligatory. If the person that would experience that joy is not being deprived by its absence. Would you agree with that? Um. I think that we're I think we're obliged to uh, express subjectivity to the greatest degree. Um, so I think that there is positive duties. Uh, okay, I agree with po there being positive duties, but I'm saying if uh, no one is going to be deprived by the failure to obtain that duty, uh, would the, you I mean, still loss of opportunity. I mean, it depends like in how we de define it, right? Because like kind of like opportunity loss, isn't it? Like there is a loss, the joy that would have potentially happened. So is so that they, joy that would potentially happen uh, if no one's being deprived of that joy be a duty? Um, well, I mean, I'm not going to look, I'm not, I, I wouldn't put this in terms of joy. So I think it's expression of subjectivity, right? I would lay this straight to the subjective um, okay. to the individual themselves. So I'd say like, I guess, let me, let me, but, let me, but let me frame it like this. Um, do you, uh, um, do you, have what's the word i'm looking for um do you regret not causing people to exist to experience subjectivity do i regret not causing people to exist to experience subjectivity um probably not because i think they wouldn't have experienced like a you know positive well-being i don't think there'll be any sort of good subjectivity expression you know there wouldn't be ex you wouldn't have any freedom um in that respect um so i think that would have probably just been pretty miserable and uh so no i don't i don't really regret it okay but if if we could say that they would have a good experience they would have a good life um uh, would you feel a duty to create that life um I mean, like this. Is, I, I mean, my opinion is no. We don't have a duty to do it. We would. We, we consider it. We can say it's like uh, a good thing, maybe even supererogatory. And the, I think this, I is, would, this is kind of the thing. I would say any duties actually lie in the institutions, right? And I'm not avoiding the thing because I'd say they're going to fight it. But if you assume that's it, there's a duty in the institution to have children. Um, in having the children, the expression of that duty would actually lead to a rational conclusion in the sense that i would say that it was increasing the expression of subjectivity um then yes i would regret not doing my duty so you think the expression of subjectivity is intrinsic intrinsically valuable yes so you would you, you lament the fact that there's not more people to exp uh to express their subjectivity um only if it would express because i would say i'm because i'm an indifferentist when we talk about subjectivity you can increase the number of subjects to infinite and it would only be one like the, there's only one concept being expressed so if it wouldn't actually increase the expression of subjectivity as in like the one concept then um uh, and would actually decrease it then then it would not actually be a good thing like having more people is not necessarily a good thing um okay it's it's only well, let's the, say let's say we have a, a experience machine that we're able to plug nearly infinite number of people into uh, and they're going to have uh, good experiences their entire life mm -hmm. um, would we have an obligation to create people to plug into that machine um 
Like, this is the an thing. obligation. I, I mean, it's is it a duty? I don't mean would it be a good thing for those people. I mean, do you actually have a duty to go out? I don't out and, think and, there is a difference between a good thing for those people and what is actually good. I mean, that's why I was saying. I mean, so like just to give you a brief understanding of indifferentism, like I think the notion of right and wrong, um, or like like uh, like yeah, like the notions of right and wrong universally contains all subjectivity. So when I'm talking about the expression of subjectivity, I'm talking about freedom. I think that mm. the freedom of the whole is one and the same of, of as the freedom of each and every individual person. Like that universal so as as, freedom. Right. So as long as there's like two people that are infinitely uh, able to express their subjectivity, that's as good as a trillion people who can do the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. So, uh, with that, I would say you. Do, I don't think you would have an uh, a duty to create those people just in order to have more people that can create. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it would be more right. like okay. if so. the, if it was, let's say, like expression of subjectivity was not going to, let's say, birth and death rates. The death rate was preventing, let's say, society functioning. So subjectivity was falling, and if we had children, then we could prevent. Um, uh, you know, more people would like having more people would actually allow for um, the greater expression of subjectivity. Then you could say like, oh, actually, having children is an obligation. Okay. Um, but then, right. I, I, um, I, I think yeah, that, so that yeah, that yeah. to me that's more of a secondary um thing that so, but going back to um, I will say, can I just two... pause at this just just so the internet listen chat know? I think our society's broken as fuck. Um, I think this probably need to really consider whether you are going to have children, the state that you actually exist in, whether you would be making things better or worse. There's so many things to consider. Um, and obviously we should look to our institutions and the reasons that, that those contain. I'm just providing a hypothetical here. Uh, sorry. Yeah. There we go. I mean, at the very, uh, just as a sidebar, at the very least, any vegan who's, who's vegan for ethical reasons shouldn't have kids just on the basis that their kids are very likely, based on population uh, uh, demographics, to be carnist or non-vegan. I don't, I don't think we've got any evidence yeah. to say that, to be entirely honest with you, because um, we don't... My don't, kids aren't vegan. Well, I, look... I know I, it's anecdotal I, evidence, but... I, I was going to say, like, well, I think it's, it's kind of anecdotal in the sense that, like, look, there's no reason for us to necessarily believe that what kids would reject veganism um, if we're engaged in, like, you know, vegan community excuse me and all those sorts of things but also whether or not uh, we would also have a positive impact upon the normativity of society you know like raising what kill children vegan um yeah. and things like that so there's there's a whole ballpark of things to consider when it's like being a vegan like a vegan a vegan parent i don't think it boils down to yeah this, you, this you, reminds you. me a lot of um the christian uh and i don't mean to say this is what your reasoning is but it reminds me of the the christian um uh, idea that um, we should have kids because my kids, the ones that I raise, will be Christian and therefore go to heaven, and <laughs> they won't. They won't have any risk of going to hell because I, I'm a good parent, right? I know how to teach my kid how to be. No, a I mean, like, I think it's just a modulated. Um, I think the risk is modulated. I think that is in a way that can't be expressed, though. Like, I don't think okay. we we'll have reasons to believe that, or like, a vegan person raising a ch child vegan would be would have the same likelihood of becoming non-vegan. As obviously someone who's raised in, let's say, a kind of carnist dogmatic environment. Do you know what I mean? Um, oh yeah, I'd say the risk is definitely less, but there's still a significant risk. I would say it's just hard to kind of quantify. That's I guess. Yeah. That's, that's, okay. Uh, I, sure, I'd say I agree with it. It's hard to quantify. Um, so anyway, to circle back, um, based on our agreement that we have a prohibition from creating unnecessary or, sorry, unjustified or unjustifiable suffering. Uh, and my claim would be that procreation causes unjustified suffering and no obligation to create those people uh, to experience joy because they're not gonna be deprived if they never come to existence. Then uh, weighing those two sides would lead me to conclude that it's uh, prohibited from, uh, we are prohibited from creating new people. Okay, but I don't understand. So 
one, I don't understand why you'd necessarily say that we are. So like, like, here's the thing. So we are producing subjects who may or may not feel like they will feel some negativity and some positivity. They will suffer and they'll feel well-being. Mm -hmm. Why aren't we? Are we, we? We are responsible for that well-being. You would say that we are as responsible for the well-being as the suffering. Once they exist, yes. Yes, and in as much we are then culpable, you would say, for only the suffering, um, or we are, or, or rather, that we are culpable for both. But the only thing we are obligated to avoid is suffering and not bring around well-being. Uh, I, yeah, I think that's right. But I don't we understand are why are we not obligated to bring around well-being. Um, because we don't, no, no, there's not going to be anybody that's deprived. Like the person that would but experience about, that well-being being isn't about, being deprived. Yeah, but it's not about it. being, de like, so for example, it's not about being deprived. It's just an in and of itself. Like, are we assuming, like, would you, would you say well-being is good? Not in and of itself. No, I don't agree with that. So, but is suffering bad? Not in and of itself. So it's about the individual themselves experiencing it. Correct. Right. Great. I agree with you there. Thank God. Okay. But in the, the individual experiencing suffering, um, mm -hmm. the experience of suffering would be bad. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you're, you're focusing on the subject that will experience these things. And I'm focusing on our uh, prohibitions and duties Okay. Yeah. On, uh, on what acts we should take. Okay. I'm just wondering, like, so like, even if we, like, cause like, I would obviously say like more over than this, that I think that it's all about the expression of subjectivity and our duties are actually embedded in our ethical institutions. Um, and we're actually conceptually working through things which are not individualistic anyway. And I would reject this entire sort of individualistic kind of notion towards ethics. But if I assume your position I'm, ass I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that when we are engaging in morality, it's in this aggregate of reasons that these reasons are grounded in individual evaluations uh, from your... This is what I'm understanding, that these are individual evaluations of pain and pleasure, basically, or, like, suffering and well-being. Or, like, so, um, so, like, so it's that you don't want to suffer and you do want well-being. So, if everyone wants well-being, and we aggregate that, why would that not be a duty, is what I'm asking. Right, because there is a, uh, a difference between causing the, our, our, our duty to cause well-being to exist when it's not necessary for the being, versus our prohibition from causing them to suffer... Uh, if we like, if we take the counter example of we don't cause them to exist, they won't suffer and they won't have well-being, right? Yes, I, I agree. We have that. not done we have not done anything wrong, but we also have not done anything good. Right. Okay. But if we cause somebody to to um, experience suffering, we have a prohibition against that, but we don't have a duty to cause the well-being if they won't if they wouldn't have experienced it otherwise. Okay, so I've got two things to say. So one, um, if, like, the whole, this only comes to point at the point of existence anyway, right? Um, and so I, I just, I still can't understand why we would have a negative obligation but not a positive obligation because it seems that everyone wants well-being and wants to avoid suffering and at the point of not creating the being, we've not done anything wrong, but we've not done anything right, as you've said. But if it, at the point of creating a being, you could say that if we were to create a being that had more pleasure than it did suffering in a ratio that was, uh, by and large, um, like felt nice for that individual, that sure. it was an experience of positivity for that individual, that would be a, 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 the right thing to do. Well, um, hold on. We already agreed that we don't have an obligation to cause that, though. Well, no, like, this is the thing. I'm asking, Ron, I'm asking you why you think this obligation doesn't exist. Like, so I, I think that I said that I think positive obligations do exist before. 
Um, yeah, and I, I didn't disagree. I don't just, I just don't think this is one of them. But I just don't understand why you wouldn't. And then the second point because, is, what if everyone in society thinks this is a the like the right thing to do anyway? So let's mm-hmm. say you individually think that it's like because let's be honest, anti-natalists are the minority, right? Same as vegans as well, right? You know, um, why would your moral reasoning? Like super, like uh, like uh, like um, like circumvent moral reasoning, which stands up and above, um, like the this like your judgment. Like you'd be like, right, well, this, like objectively, moral reasoning tells me I should have children. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're asking. Because you're saying that like all these reasons are. Like, what moral reasoning is, isn't subject to the particular individual, but at the same time is aggregated of particular judgments or particular reasons that individuals make towards yeah, the expression of I'd their I'd be desires. careful not to say judgments, because that's based on the belief. Well, and the reasons are not necessarily based on beliefs. But go ahead. Okay. So, let's say you said that it's just purely... Um, it's these reasons. Everyone has these reasons. Right, and that's these like, and these reasons are. Wait, wait, what? What? What do you want to define reasons as? By the way, let's um, just, let's just. Yeah. So there are the uh, how to define reasons. There are desire or prohibition-based motivations to cause another to uh, act in some way or have different desires. So, wait. Sorry. So that you again, can have so like also oh, the, the reasons would uh, so again reasons are, um, are motivations to have someone act in differently. Yeah. If I have a, for example, but if the, I okay, have but a, the, so the mo- majority uh, of the population have the motivation to destroy antinatalism as a notion and to produce more children. They want more children. Let's just assume. I don't think they do, but let's just assume they did. It would be immoral to be an antinatalist then. Um, no. I don't understand. Because, <laughs> I'm okay, totally because, lost. <laughs> uh, the because the reason not to be an natalist, antinatalist is not uh, due to the reasons people have to have kids. It is due to the prohibition against causing unnecessary and unjustified suffering. Right. So you're saying we already have, the, right? So this is the claim you made. You want, one, we already have these moral reasons. They don't cohere with our actions. Correct. Right. Okay. That makes things a little bit easier. And you're saying that the moral reasoning comes from our desire to co- to not cause unnecessary suffering. and um, But we also don't desire then to cause well-being. We can cut. Co- we desire to cause well-being in people that exist, but we don't have a reason to cause new people to exist in order to experience well-being. Because if we didn't, they wouldn't be deprived. And, but and this it's, is evidence by the but that's, fact that's that that's exactly the same position. Like, look, this is kind of why asymmetry has to happen, right? At this point, because you could say the exact same thing about the suffering. The individual yeah, but, isn't going to be yeah. deprived of well-being or um, experience negativity unless they exist. So, right, but so, when we so talk well, about humans, I don't we're, have talking, a moral, we're not oh, talking about some, some uh, just conceptual the conceptualization. We're talking about uh, beings that exist, right? We don't, we don't lament the fact that there's not an infinite amount of AIs being currently created in order to experience well-being. But just because well-being. we don't lament it doesn't mean that we shouldn't. Like, that's the that's kind of what the point you're making. Like, just because we act as if we should have children doesn't mean we or, or we act as, and we do have children doesn't mean we should have children, right? Based off these, like, sort of um, motive uh, underlying motives for engaging in moral discourse. Yeah. I'm making a claim about the way um, things are. You kind of okay. like it's kind of like a meta ethical claim you're making. Really, that's kind of like look. These are the principles that are kind of guiding morality as a whole, um, and 
one is about like the like you know avoiding ne- unnecessary suffering and the other is about let's say producing uh well-being now what you want to say is that in not having children we avoid unnecessary suffering so not having children is good but you don't want to say that having children which experience greater well-being than suffering is also good based on the same principles and that's what's confusing us because it's an asymmetry yeah. argument yeah it is a type of asymmetry i i, I wouldn't agree with that or i wouldn't disagree with that okay and i'm um, just kind of confused as to okay. what's the justification for that asymmetry i'm not saying well the justification is that this is how people are we don't we don't have uh people who lament the fact that there's not people on mars have experiencing well-being i don't know people kind of do though because people do want to like create settlers and expand the human population like people do want to do that stuff but even if they didn't lament it right let's say they didn't lament it um and but they they don't necessarily lament uh the idea of it actually happening either so let's say they're indifferent to it right so, so we're indifferent in- towards the creation of this well-being but we're not indifferent to the creation of the suffering that will ensue but we're right? also we, we feel not we have indifferent. a prohibition yes i agree not that we feel yeah right but, so but, but then that's the um, thing we're also not indifferent to the well-being it will create but only for the people that exist well yes but this is all coming into exist at the point of existence right we've agreed that we don't necessarily lament the existence the non-existence of negative or positive because it doesn't exist there's nothing to lament right <laughs> right so i think we we'll both well, agree with that let, let think, me ask you this is it good so that this this will kind of answer the question is it a good thing that there are no there's no one um let's say uh suffering in the ovens of Nash, um auschwitz right now well absolutely that it is a good thing yes it is a good thing yes yes so you agree that you can have a good thing without anyone experiencing the opposite um as in like it would yeah well yeah i, w- I would talk about the concept okay. of subjectivity as we've said and i would say that that would overall reduce the freedom and the expression of subjectivity as a whole like the existence okay. of those so people the, suffering um would be would be worse however the existence of people living incredible lives would also increase it and it's also sad that they don't live a lot their lives as well so you're saying the corollary which would be um you think they would be bad if there was no one to experience an expression of sub- subjectivity yeah, I mean, if subjectivity, that would be a bad I don't think it would be bad if there was no expression of subjectivity. I think that there would be no such thing as a like, good or bad because subjectivity is right. is the measure is is what is uh, the measure of good and bad. It's like the the, exactly. the subjective expression, right? Yeah, like and so yeah. Yeah. so like so you 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 agree there is an asymmetry because you you've just stated no, I don't. you would think well you you How, did hold on a second sorry, let me explain. show you yeah go on you said you would agree that it's good that no one suffers in the ovens of Auschwitz. Mm-hmm. So there's no one to experience that, but it's still a good situation. Yeah. And then it's not bad that uh, if no one, it wouldn't be bad if no one were around to experience subjectivity. But no, no, no. So this is the thing. Like what, if there was no one at all, there would be no concept of subjectivity as the yardstick of good and bad. So there right. would be no such thing as right and wrong. Like ethics happens at the point of existence. That's now, what I said. It's not bad. It wouldn't. It would not be bad. I didn't say it, it would be good. But, I said it would be not bad. But it would also be bad for people to not be around living happy lives. So, like, in the sense that, like, if they, I don't agree with that. Well, this is that's, this is the thing. I think well, that's our, our basis that's of disagreement. That's the asymmetry. Think... That's the asymmetry. Now, I'm wondering. Right where the asymmetry so i think that we are obligated to the expression of subjectivity primarily first and foremost to the removal of negative like for the removal of like negativity of negative expression where it's like the uh, trespassing upon the subjectivity of others you know in relation to our own personal actions and then the greater expression of those individuals um uh you know uh freedom like that desires like giving them the greatest content of their desires so that they can go and live um uh rationally free lives that live that like you know produce as much 
positive experience for subjects as possible. Um, and that would be that would be the expression of their freedom. That would be the expression of everyone's freedom. And that's that is what we are talking about when something is right or wrong. And this is right. all of this as a yardstick is subjectivity itself. And so at right. the point I, of having a child, what we are considering is like before we have a child, um, what we are considering is subjectivity itself. And if we, if, but if there was, and, and when we're considering those people in Auschwitz, we're considering subjectivity itself, which exists. But if there was, but, uh, but in, it's the same thing as if we, ha if we are considering, let's say, producing a society, let's say like loads of us are going to get together. We're going to go and produce a society on uh, Mars it's going to be the bomb. Everyone's going to love it there. Everyone's going to have a great time. We're going to increase the expression of subjectivity. We're going to, you know, we might even be able to help others reduce their suffering. We're going to live moral, like, well, ethical lives. Uh, and we're going to, you know, it's going to be the best society ever. Yeah, that we are 100% obligated to produce a better society. That's exactly okay. what, I, like, like, in that respect. Um, okay. So, and if that meant having children, like, I don't see the, I don't see the issue. Okay, so my issue is this. We, you agreed previously that um, two people with the uh, ability to fully express their subjectivity would be just as good as a million. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right? So let's just say we have only an obligation to create people insofar as there will be some expression of subjectivity, even if it's only one person. Can you agree with that much? Um, like so, there's no reason to add to the pool. Is what I'm saying. There's there's, they, there's no, no reason, reason to just get we, obsessed the, with. It's not about quantity; it's about quality. Yeah, so qual a qualifier. Right. Yeah, yeah. And if it would increase the quality of existing people to have less people, then you would agree that that would be a duty. Oh, 100 percent. Overpopulation. Okay. Stop having kids, you selfish bastards. Right. Well, if I could convince you that any amount of kids, in addition to what we already have would decrease the overall uh, expression of subjectivity, then you would agree that we should stop as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I don't have, but this is another argument I could use. I don't have time to do it right now, but maybe-, maybe Yeah, that's, can, um, that's entirely my fault. I, I, I will apologize for that. You had like five hours free, and then I've just squandered <laughs> that entire time. I'm sorry, I'm the least organized person ever. Like, um, but I, like, and you could make that argument, I'll say, um, and I would accept that argument. And I would say that that is contextual. That is, the, the universal principle being invoked here has nothing to do with whether we should or should not have children uh, in general. But, like, so, for example, universally, having children would not necessarily be wrong. They're given the, they're given the context. So an antinatalism yeah, anti would be rejected then. It would be contextually wrong. You'd be like saying, it would be wrong to have children in X, Y, and Z, but it also could be right to have children in A, B, and C. And that, that would be, I don't think that would be compatible, at least to my understanding, with an antinatalist position. All right. Well, from, from what I understand of your position, it would never be obligatory to cause someone to, to come into existence uh, um, unless and only unless uh, that would somehow increase the ability to uh, uh, express subjectivity. Yeah, I mean, like, I think yeah. that our duties are non-individuated. Like, I don't pick them anyway. Like, I'm not the one that's like, ah, I get to choose. Like, you know, I think it's like rationally right. determined through like imminent institutional development. Um, but I think you you would also agree. I think we've we've, we've already set this flag that you agree that um, it's wrong to create uh, unnecessary and unjustified suffering. And your your contention is that the same it is reason, like that, I think that this is what under, I think that if to give you more clarity, this is what underpins what duties and what laws in society. We, we, you know, we don't cause people to um, we don't trespass upon other individuals' freedoms uh, on the rights and liberties of other individuals, and we try to express okay. the rights and liberties of individuals to the greatest degree. Yeah, and I, I think um, so. One of the principles that um, all and I, I don't want to get too deep into this because, I, like I said, I do have to go. But one of the principles, and I don't mean the particular, but the principle of consent is violated every time you cause someone to come into existence. Because you're um, putting that person into a situation that they did not choose to be in. Well, 
I, I would say that the judgment that you are talking about in terms of consent could not have been made concrete until the individual could actually judge it, which is post right. their existence. Which is why. So they, yeah, which, they is, which, which I, I would say that they could not have not have consented. It's like even if they, it's like it's not a violation of their will because their will did not exist. You haven't nope, violated. I didn't say that. No, but that's the thing. I like, said it's a violation of the principle of consent. Well, no, because I think that, like, so, for example, I think that an individual, so you could even be wrong about a judgment, right? So you could be, like, take, take for example, like, uh, children who believe they've consented to, like, sex acts with adults. We'd be like, no, you haven't. You're incapable of consent. Um, right. And what we're talking about is then we're saying that there are underlying preconditions for what consent actually is, which is the expression of that subjectivity. You can't consent to something which is actually harmful and irrational. Um, so like an individual can't consent to being murdered, uh, which is why I would say like an individual actually can't like, you know, go and sell themselves to a cannibal, which is what they like, all not sell themselves, but like give themselves to a cannibal, which is what like tried to happen in Germany one time. Right. would say that. Right. No, you can't consent to that. You're insane. Um, that, that would be that that's where I would say, like, if we look at what the conditions of what consent means, it's already post existence. Um, no, if, I don't agree with that. See, because they, could they, well, you how would have, you express like what consent? Consent, like how would you define consent? So, I define the principle of consent is you should refrain from putting someone into a situation without their agreement, unless you have prior knowledge of their assent to that type of situation. And obviously, those kinds of Wait, so, uh, things so saying, are violated whenever you create somebody because you can't get their consent ahead of time. And you can't know what their interests are ahead of time. Well, wait a minute. I'd say that you can't. I, I, I would say you can know your, their interests ahead of time, at least for the most part. It hasn't been made concrete, but like abstractly, you could have knowledge of what, like, so you, you know that they're going to be human. You know, like the possibilities of their existence. If you did know all of the possibilities, then you would know all of the possible interests that they could have. Um, if you know the majority of them, then you, you could probably um have a have a good understanding of what their interests are going to be like that, that's one of the reasons why i can make judgments about their suffering and well-being in the first place like i know that they're going to have an interest in not being like burnt alive and stuff right you know um <laughs> um which is why like i would say like yeah i can make reasonable uh like ethical claims about like the individual's ontology okay um, and, um, and then, yeah, I mean, obviously, we're, there's there's going to be points that we're we're just not going to come to an agreement. That, that's fair enough. Uh, uh, that's but fair. Here's, here's what I'll say. I say like when we talk at consent, and we look at let's say like like I would say that consent is the like consent would I would say would be the is is an act of permission or um or a per permissible um um action to perform against an individual or to perform to an individual so to bring someone into existence you, there's a question of whether that would be an act to them i, I would I, i'm willing to just say that it is um in which case like bringing them into existence was this act of um their creation permissible and that's what would underlie consent because if like consent would imply that you are breaching the freedom of an individual, like if it, if someone does not consent to you stopping them from killing themselves, you wouldn't say you've breached their consent. You've actually acknowledged. You would say that they were trying to breach their own consent, and I stopped them. Um, you know, depending on like I would anyway. So this is where I would say that when we talk about consent, it has to be post-existence, um, and whether it's permissible i think you, if you've brought someone into life to use as a means to an end you are breaching their consent in their in the violation of their rights but well and that, and that's where that and and it's at the point of rights that we talk about consent everyone has a right yeah. to to expect certain behavior and if you are breaching those rights then you are wrong if you are not breach, and you are breaching their consent um would you agree that's with that? that's, well that's you, you kind of touched on another one of my arguments, which is that um, all reasons to have somebody, uh, to create somebody, are only means to an end. They're never for the end itself. I know you, you, you have this idea of expressing their subjectivity. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I, I don't want to get uh, too bogged down, like I said, but 
Um, because I mean, I can I can see that the because I think the individual is indifferent to the substance of like what we are talking about as the individual in society. I don't think that there are. I wouldn't argue for the existence of let's say um, particulars that are separate from the universal that exists as individuality. So, like, if you can bring them into into being for themselves, which is part and parcel of the universal principles of like or the universality of of subjectivity. Um, if you're trying to express subjectivity itself um so yeah like that's like and but i, I do think look i, I, think, I will say like i will say i this. do think you're you're kind of unique in that though i mean if you ask uh you know nine uh, nine hundred ninety nine out of a thousand parents or people who are going to be parents why they're doing it th this is not going to be the reason <laughs> oh yeah i completely agree with you and i think people do it on okay. selfish reasons i think people do it for the wrong reason i think people exploit the shit out of their kids i think most parents are bad i think that um a lot of people shouldn't have had kids and i think that the and that's why i'm sympathetic to Andy natalists i think that like, like what the way our society actually engages with reproduction is terrible <laughs> like yeah um that's like, is, that's undeniable the problem is uh so I would agree with you as a as practical as a practical and an, and a natalist. I would say you're probably that. But then the, the issue is you're going to have biases that lead you to believe that you're better than the rest of the population. The, the idols uh, of in, the cave in a way that would justify you having kids. Yeah, I mean the idols of the cave in terms of uh, in terms of like Francis Bacon when he talks about that. Like you know we all have our individuated like psychological biases that makes makes us think that like for whatever reason. Uh, you know, like, uh, you know, there's something that isn't the case. And like, you know, and I think there is a good idiom that he says, um, you know, um, um, hold, I think it's hold with the greatest scrutiny, that which brings you the most pleasure. Um, and I think that is, that is probably right. Like, if you like the idea a lot, you're probably mm -hmm. biased. Um, right. <laughs> and you haven't thought it through. Uh, and, and I think that like, that's, he's probably right in that. And, but... I, I wouldn't say that necessarily means that, like, for example, individual contexts don't genuinely modify whether it, you know. So, for example, if if I was in an economically better situation, if um, I was in an economically worse situation, if I wouldn't, like, you know, like, for example, let's say the world economy collapses or something and, you know, food is scarce and I'm talking about bringing kids in when we can't feed they, you know who will have like i'll be a dick like I, I think that i think that's where we need to really have these conversations where we start talking yeah, about but, what we are trying to but do that's here. Just like your opinion man <laughs> no, <yeah>. right? <laughs> because but, like think about this here's a here's something to consider uh I, I don't mean to keep bringing this up but it is a it is instructive there were jews in auschwitz that were having kids right yeah, you know this like, is the look, thing that happened I'm not, because they they were optimistic about the the world uh, after them. I think like I'm, I'm uh, not gonna lie, I'm impressed at that level. And, you've got to be you've got to be like one hell of an optimist. I get sad sometimes just just in general. I don't know how you could be like that much of an optimist in Auschwitz. Well, that's that's like, how, like, like like that's how I, the way you feel about that is how I feel about all our, our evolved biases. You know, whether it's optimism bias, silver lining bias, Pollyan, uh, Pollyanna bias, right? Like, I, I try to take as objective view as I can. And well, that's the thing, but I'm, I'm all, saying all that, the like, reasons that well, people give to have kids, almost all of them are, are due to some of one of the one or more of these biases. Well, I think like, obviously, I think that we can't have reasons which are institutionally embedded and imbued and that are rational outside of like the judgment of one individual or, or, or their like reasoning i think our society is quite unique in the sense that it is very individualistic in in history like most societies never used to be like so when people were having kids in the past it wasn't like oh i want to have kids it was like it is your duty to have children for the state <laughs> you know yeah. you, you will birth yeah. us sons anyway like, um, or else how are we gonna how are we gonna you know work the farm if we don't have enough hands right? ex exactly right so like um, it, our society is quite different in the sense like we're not yeah. like we'll, we'll have the opportunity to have a decline in population and not necessarily lead to economic ruin although there are still maybe some issues um, the we'll have the um, we'll also have the um, 
we've also questioned where institutions, like we've hit a point of individualism where our inst- institutions seem to be almost separate from reasons. Like reasons have been made in our society to appear to be individuated to the individual. Um, when I would say that reasons are collective um, and exist in our institutions. Um, and that, that that's like one of the big... that, And I do think I differ, I, I differ from a lot of people on that, which is why like most people I talk to are probably like, are mostly like social contract theorists, right? They're all like, oh yeah, um, we're all selfish, self-orientated, and we only work together for mutual advantage. And this is all individually reasoned from my, from my kind of um you know egotistical individual individual worldview right that's that's kind of like yeah. the majority of what people think here yeah. and that's just because yeah, I, that's just because of like <laughs> liberalism and shit was really successful yeah and it, i if you couldn't tell i'm i'm definitely not a social contractor well that's the thing i don't think you are i don't think you are but i think that um <laughs> but I, I think that that's the majority of our population and uh, unfortunately yeah, I so, would like, so yeah. uh, and and I, I think that the only thing that is probably more ubiquitous is a consequentialist view um what is good and bad in even for the individual is judged by like the their experiences and the the satisfaction which is almost hobbesian in itself it's like when we did i actually achieve what i wanted am i currently eating the cake um right. if i am not then this is bad <laughs> and, right. and, and and so there's that as well um but the like i think that this is I don't know. I think that we're in a state now where, like, you know, most of our institutions are in crisis. Um, the the There's just as many people who pretty much disagree with our institutional format as agree with it um, in a reactionary way, not necessarily in a substantial way uh, most of the time. Um, do you know what I mean? It's not like they're reasoning out that it's wrong. They're just rejecting it for the sake of rejecting it. It's like, no, I disagree, no. you know? Um, yeah. um, I think that most people are now being produced by a market environment in which they consume themselves and um, all of their sort of... Subl- they sublimate their desires into what... Rather than, let's say... A society which you know puts them into an institutional environment where they're like you know like they have these social roles which is meant to express their subjectivity in that way they're instead sublimated into an environment which seeks to um uh, like um put them on a path of uh like uh, perpetual self-satisfaction right like and that that now has moved from even from like a notion of having like the the, the process of having something is now actually appearing to be something and we're all like trying to appear to each other as if we are this thing that we all want to be in the eyes of each other and so we're all actually desiring some sort of social recognition um as a form of currency and that's like social media now yeah. and that's but where we're kind of sit uh, and it's just an illusion yeah and it's just I, bullshit. <laughs> it is bullshit unfortunately it is actually kind of bullshit and that's where we're at so you know, I, I can understand you're just not wanting to have children into that. You'd be like, well, fuck. Like, that, that's really shit. And I wouldn't even disagree necessarily. Um, like, you, wanna, you know, it's funny that you're, t- you're mentioning this. When I, the, so I haven't been anali- antinatalist for very long. It's been about um, a little over four years. And um, you'll, you'll think this is funny. But what actually caused me to start thinking this way was uh, when Trump got uh, elected. I can understand. <laughs> I'm like, I can, yeah, I, can, I, can just, I just. I don't want to. I don't want to raise or bring in anybody into a world that would think Trump is a good candidate for presidency. Yeah, I know what you mean. I think that's exactly. I think I, I, I say this. I say this to my girlfriend all the time. I'm like, I just, I, like, I just sometimes like I, I never thought Trump was going to get elected. Like I, I, to, I totally. I think there was one point when I said like I was like it's a joke. There's no way. And then it just, oh, yeah. of, and then it kind of just dawned on us. I was like, wait a minute, wasn't this guy like a reality TV star? I was like, oh shit! <laughs> I was like, of yeah. course he's going to get elected in the United States. That's exactly who the president should be. Um, oh yeah, and it, it, it fit as well, I think. But it's only a, it's only a representation of the sad state we're in. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think that this is, but this is it. Like in terms of like, I think that this needs to be challenged. Um. Um, and I think that, like, I guess, like, this is, I don't think that this necessarily, 
I think that this needs to be challenged. I think that this we can challenge this. I think that I would be. Uh, you know, there are like real things that we can make judgments of outside of this, to some degree. Um, but all of this, like, what we really need to kind of focus on is getting our institutions back on track, making solid arguments, and um, kind of just making sure things, like, kind of progress onwards. I think, like, so, for example, I think that market socialism is still possible. Um, I think that we can move to, in the right direction. I think that the political situation is sad, but not irreversible. Um, well, I think... Part of the problem, in, at least in the state, is that people uh, don't desire, and you know, going back to my model in the first place, but they don't desire uh, truth, right? They don't have a, a high value on truth. They value uh, group coherence more mm -hmm. than truth. So, in a state like that, it's going to be very, very difficult to convince anybody to uh, of a truth of something when they don't care about that, right? The first step is to convince them that they ought to value truth. Right. And yeah, that's, I mean, that's difficult because you can't reason somebody into that. You have to, uh, you know, I think uh, I, I, mean, I would argue that you already like, so like I would take the argument that you already do desire truth. Um, if you just don't know it, like, you know, all men, I think actually Aristotle just popped up on my screen with all men desire to subscribe. Uh, but the actual quote is all men desire to know, right? So like, like, um, this is, um, like, th this is like the kind of principled point is like, knowledge is inherently valuable. Um, and you already desire it. Like it's, it's valuable well, in the sense that it is, even if you say that it's pragmatically or extrinsically valuable, like you can't really deny that it's it, without the, for example, the only reason like people say, well, what if I desired not to know something it's like well you'd have to know that you didn't want to know it so you'd need the knowledge <laughs> like, like, like so this is kind of like where you, you, you i think that you, you can always make an argument for why individuals should value knowledge and i think you're probably right i think people do value i think it's more of like uh i i, I think you're right in the sense that it's uh, well i think there's two things i think that one the reasoning that individuals are applying is mutually exclusive to two at least two traditions in the United States, two separate traditions, which are coming at ethics from a very different notion, like a very different notion of ethics. And so you kind of have like these two competing um, ethical, um, ethical spirits, if you will, or spirits that need to be merged into one for a unified state. In other words, I think that the words United States uh, uh, is just a lie, like a bald faced lie. There is nothing united about the United States. Like, uh, it's just not one, it's not one country. It's actually at least two countries that are getting along for, or at least two states getting along for mutual benefit, right? It's a social contract between two separate nations. Anyway, the, 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 th the thing is, uh, you've got that. But I think that can be fixed. And then I think you've also got the fact that people now don't see truth existing at all like i think that they think that it's all down to their own positions that everyone comes from these axioms and they all talk about how it's just my position and they try and argue from that like you know that's like vosh or and it's like you know it's all praxis and that dogma that, that that like that that kind of pollutes um anything it comes into contact with it just undermines like knowledge itself and yeah. and i think once you're in that situation it's just absurdity it's like right nothing matters might makes right there we go and then you just straight up in, 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 in a wall like like that really yeah all right man i gotta i gotta get off but um i appreciate the time yeah yeah and um thanks thanks again for coming on uh i'm sorry that it took us a while to um obviously to sort this out and, and everything but i do appreciate the arguments um, next yeah, and I thought this is a, I thought this is a very very good uh, conversation. Yeah, it's been a very good conversation, and I, I do I do think that like Annie Nitlas are right in the sense that we do need to uh, consider whether we should or should not have children. Um, and I think we need to have a little bit more of a like a reflexive approach on whether we can have right, kids. Now, so I'm just going to clip I'm just going to clip where you just said Antonitlas are right. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> welcome, <laughs> welcome right, to man. politics. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> I, but uh, thanks again, and uh, take it easy, mate, and um, have a good one. All right, thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye.